everyone for joining us today. My name is Jie Huang. I'm an immigration attorney at Scott Legal PC. Today, we are going to spend some time talking about several visa options available for individuals with extraordinary abilities in their fields. So just a few things before we get started. Uh, as you may know, Scott Legal is a full-service immigration law firm, which means we do have expertise handling a wide variety of non-immigrant and immigrant visas uh, categories suited for various circumstances. So whatever your immigration needs may be, uh, be it a family-based, employment-based, or investment-based matter, we can help you find a solution. We will be continuing this webinar series, doing at least two webinars a month on different immigration law topics. At the end of this webinar, uh, we will be sending out a few things to all participants. First, we will send you a copy of the PowerPoint that will be used in this webinar. Second, we will be sending you a guide, um, a comprehensive visa guide to all of the visa categories that we will be discussing today. We will also send you a link where you can sign up for additional webinars that are coming up in the future, uh, and also this webinar as it will be recorded. Uh, this webinar will also be made available on YouTube, and we do encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel as we do upload regularly uh, immigration law videos on a variety of topics. Finally, we will send you a link uh, where you can follow to set up a consultation with one of our uh, experienced lawyers should you wish to discuss your case further. So today we are very lucky to have Kelly Wiener, managing attorney at the firm, with a wealth of experience handling uh, many cases in these visa categories that we will be speaking about today. We will be presenting about the various visa categories available to extraordinary ability individuals and the requirements and considerations. Finally, for any questions you may have, uh, please feel free to add them to the chat box or use the Q&A function, and we will try and get to all questions. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Kelly. Thank you, Jay. So um, we're going to get started today just by talking about, um, you know, the extraordinary ability visa categories, um, in particular, the O1A, O1B, and the EB1A. Um, we'll go into more detail about each of these categories in the upcoming slides, um, but, you know, important things to know about each one. So the O1A, um, this is a non-immigrant visa, so that means it's it's temporary. It does not permit you to stay in the U.S., um, you know, uh, like a green card does uh, permanently, uh, but it does provide you with the ability to get a three-year visa, and then you can renew that visa um, in increments of either one year for extensions, or if there's kind of a new set of projects or a new, um, you know, endeavor you're working on, sometimes you can get it renewed in increments of three years, and there's no limit on how many um, times you can renew it. So when we think about, for example, the H-1B or the L, those are visas that have limits on them. You can only get an H-1B for up to six years before you have to leave the country. You can only get an L-1A for seven years. For the O-1, um, that they don't have those limits. You can kind of continue to renew those visas or to get new visas over the years as needed. So the O-1A, um, again, is for individuals with extraordinary ability in sciences, education, business, or athletics. Um, the standard for this is, is relatively high. It's, you know, if, are you one of a small percentage who's risen to the very top of your field? Um, and in order to do that, um, as we'll go into detail on um, future slides, you show that you either have one um, very large accomplishment, like you've won a Nobel Prize or a Pulitzer Prize, or you meet three out of the um, you know criteria that they've outlined. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the O-1B. So similar to the O-1A in the sense that it's a non-immigrant visa, so temporary visa, similar in the sense that you can get it for three years and you can renew um, you know an extensions of one year. Um, this visa is for people with extraordinary ability in the arts um, and also extraordinary ability in motion picture or television industry. Um, so for the arts, the standard is a little bit lower, uh, you know, than the O1A. You have to have received distinction um, in your field, which is a high level of achievement as evidenced by a degree of skill and recognition substantially above that ordinarily encountered um, to the extent the person is described as prominent, leading, or well-known in the field of arts. So this distinction category is, is um, lower than the, the standard for the O1A. Um, you know, so that's something where 
Um, if you're considering, like sometimes there are people that could go O1A or O1B, um, you know, something that comes to mind, for example, are, um, you know, bartenders, sometimes there's kind of mixologists, um, you know, sometimes there's people that could be deemed, you know, business or, or arts. Um, so if you do have that flexibility, often it can be beneficial to apply under the O1B because the standard that you're meeting is lower. Um, you do need to be able to make the argument about why you, um, those criteria are applicable to you, um, but it is something to consider. So then let's look at the EB1A. So this um, is a green card. So this is a, a permanent um, you know, ability to stay in the United States. So this is distinguished from the O1A and the O1B in that regard. Um, and the EB1A is for individuals with extraordinary ability in the sciences, arts, education, business, or athletics. So in the temporary um, you know, visa categories, you know, we have a distinction between O1A and O1B. Um, in the EB1A, like so if you have an O1B, and you're in the arts and you want to get a green card, the EB1A is what you're going to go for. If you're an O1A, you want to get a, a green card, generally the EB1A is what you're going to go for. So it, it encompasses both, um, you know, the business and the arts and um, sciences and athletics and education. Um, the standard is um, looks very similar to the O1A. So someone who's one of a small percentage who's risen to the very top of their field or endeavor, I um, mean, you just show sustained national or international acclaim and that your achievements have been recognized in your field of expertise. Um, and as you know, indicated below, um, you have in all instances, you have to show that you can plan to continue working in your field of expertise. Um, so for the O1A and the O1B, you know, you might include an itinerary that shows the work you're going to be doing for um, whatever length of time you're asking for. So if you're asking for the full three years, your itinerary might cover the full three years. Um, you know, for the EB1A green card, where you're going to, you know, be living in the U.S. permanently, you would include a statement that outlines kind of your future plans, you know, what you plan to do in the United States. And, um, you know, since the EB1A, although the regulatory language is quite similar, the EB1A is a green card, which means that the standard um, of proof or the standard that you have to meet um, is, is, you know, quite higher, I'd say. So just because you've received an O1A or an O1B, it does not mean that you will necessarily qualify for the EB1A. So let's dig a little bit more into the O1A. Um, so, you know, to, to qualify for this type of visa, you have to demonstrate either that you've received that major award, like a Nobel Prize, or evidence of at least three of the following. Um, and I'd say that, you know, most applicants are going to qualify based on, you know, showing they meet three of the following. So receipt of nationally or internationally recognizes prizes or awards, you know, membership and associations in your field, published material, um, you know, in professional or major trade publications about you and your work, um, original scientific scholarly or business related contributions, authorship of scholarly articles, a high salary, participation on a panel or individually as a judge or employment in a critical or essential capacity for organization, organizations and establishments that have a distinguished reputation. So most people um, are going to qualify based on trying to meet three of these criteria. Um, if you meet more than three, that is even better for your case. And you generally are going to want to show that you meet as many as possible. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, later in the presentation, but it's not enough to just say, you know, you've won an award, right? So it, like, let's say that you've won an award and it's from an organization um, that kind of, you know, gives out awards very freely to many people and is not considered uh, particularly distinguished in your field, um, you know, then that award is going to have really kind of limited value to your application. Similarly, if you're a membership in an association um, and you pay a fee and anybody um, who is a member of that profession is allowed to pay that fee and join that organization without having to show anything additional. Again, really not going to strengthen your case. Um, you need to show that, you know, for example, if you're joining um, an organization that is highly respected in your field and for which you have to demonstrate some type of achievement, perhaps not just that you've worked for many years in your field, but that um, there's particular accomplishments that you have, um, perhaps you've been published, perhaps, uh, you know, you're someone who um, is, is regularly, you know, quoted in major media about developments in your field, perhaps you're invited to give keynote presentations. Um, these are the types of things that um, you would want to see if somebody's applying for this type of visa. So you always need to think about not just, you know, have I ever published, but where have I published? Um, you know, is the organization I've published in um, a distinguished organization in itself? Um, another thing about the O1A, um, you know, visas, you're going to have to 
um, kind of get experts in your field to write letters uh, that kind of speak about, you know, your, um, you know, your contributions into the, in, in the field and, and what you've accomplished. Um, you know, it can be helpful if these are people that know you and have worked with you. Um, but it's also very helpful if you have people that are willing to write you letters that are familiar with your work, um, because your, it shows your work has a broad reach in the industry. And the people you would want to write these letters would be, you know, generally people that you would think of as qualifying for the um, extraordinary ability visa themselves, if they needed to apply for one. Um, so when you're thinking about that, you know, let's say that you are, um, you know, you say, well, I had a professor in college that really liked me, you know, um, you know, that may not be the best person to, to, to write a letter unless that professor is an expert in the field, perhaps, and, you know, maybe worked with you on um, your PhD or, or, you know, was able to speak to accomplishments that you've had in the field since, uh, you know, you, you had them in college. So whenever you're looking at this list, you always want to be thinking about, you um, not just do you meet do you meet the you know the plain language of the criteria have you participated on a panel but where have you participated on a panel um what types of organizations you know are are, are reaching out to you so let's look at the O1B. So the O1B, you know, can mimic the O1A in, in certain aspects. So it's either one very large award, um, you know, so an Emmy, a Grammy, um, you know, or um, an Oscar or evidence of at least three of the following. So, and these are focused on the arts um, because the O1B is, is for the arts or, you know, motion picture or television industry. So, you know, performing a leader starring role in productions or events, again, with this distinguished reputation. So, you know, just having performed, you know, a, a leader starring role on its own is not enough. You need to look at where you, where you performed that role. Um, critical reviews or other published material, um, evidence of performance in a lead starring or critical role for organizations or establishments with distinguished reputations. Um, and that's going to be different than productions or events. So things you want to consider. Um, evidence of a record of major commercial or cr critically acclaimed successes in the performing arts. Evidence of significant recognition for achievements. Um, evidence of having commanded a high salary or other comparable evidence. And this is, you know, also available for the for the O1A. So if you feel that, um, you know, perhaps uh, the um, area you're working in is a really new area, you know, something where there's not, you know, really established, uh, you know, um, publications or organizations or associations, you know, you can submit other comparable evidence, but you will have to make a pretty strong argument as to why the other criteria um, are not appropriate in your particular um, industry. So you're really going to be thinking about that um, only if you're in an industry where it's quite, um, you know, quite new, perhaps quite niche, has its own kind of rules of what is, um, you know, what is extraordinary in the field. And if you're going to do that, you also need to be prepared to explain to the officer about that, about that industry. So let's look at the differences between O1A and O1B. So O1A, science, education, business, or athletics. O1B, arts and motion picture or television industry. Um, the standards, you know, we, we've outlined kind of there's a difference in standards, either one of a very small percentage who's risen to the top of the field or looking at the arts, high level of achievement or motion picture, a level of acclaim substantially above that of your peers. Um, you know, when we're looking at how long is it issued for, that's pretty much exactly the same. You know, you can get your initial visa for three years for an extension. Um, if it's just extending the work you've already done, very often USCIS will only issue for one year. If you're able to make an argument that there's a new set of projects or perhaps you're working for a new employer, you know, then you can get three years um, and you can continue to renew that, um, you know, for as long as you have extraordinary ability work in the United States and can meet the criteria. Um, can your family come to the U.S.? Yes, your spouse and any unmarried children under 21 can come with you. Um, the, your uh, children and spouse can attend school if they wish, um, but your spouse is not able to work. So let's uh, turn to the EB1A green card. Um, so the requirements are very similar to the O1A and O1B, so either that major internationally recognized award or meeting three out of the 10 criteria. Um, an important thing to consider with the EB1A, and this applies to the O1A and O1B too, um, but I think is even more relevant for the EB1A because the standard is heightened since it's a green card application. Um, you know, they're going to apply what's called the Kazarian analysis. And what this means is they will look at the evidence to determine, um, you know, 
first, first of all, have you met the regulatory criteria? So have you submitted proof that you've won a national or internationally recognized award? Have you submitted proof that you are a member of an, a professional association with a distinguished reputation? And after they'll look, have, have you met that criteria? Then they're going to consider the quality of the evidence in totality. So that's where they're looking at, um, you know, when we view the, um, you know, the application package, when we view all the documentation you provided of, you know, your contributions to the field, uh, you know, what have the experts said about you? Does this indicate that you are one of the very small percentage of people who've risen to the top of your field of expertise? Um, so that's where, um, you know, it may be the case as you work with your attorney that you may say, well, it's, you know, I have all this evidence, um, but some of the evidence may not be helpful. If it's evidence that is, um, for example, awards that you won as a student, um, you know, unless they're, unless they were awards that were won, um, you know, in the professional sphere while you just happen to be a student. But if these are awards that were given out by your university or things like that, those are generally not going to be helpful. Um, so you do want to be very kind of thoughtful as you work with your attorney about what documentation am I submitting? Um, because you know that, you know, the officers are going to be looking at the evidence in totality to consider does it meet um, this criteria of showing you're someone who's risen to the very top of your field? And you don't want to include anything that's going to kind of bring that down or make them feel like, well, you're including things because you don't have enough to really demonstrate that you have that extraordinary ability in your field of expertise. So let us move now to the National Interest Waiver, and we are lucky to have um, GA, who's an expert in this area, to speak with us about um, the extraordinary ability uh, criteria. Yeah, for national interest waiver. Sure thing. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, so let's discuss the NIW, uh, which is also an immigrant visa option. So the NIW is a subset of, of the EB2 employment based visa category. And the special thing about NIWs is that you are able to self petition just like you are able in the EB1A context. Um, okay, so how would you qualify for uh, the EB2 national interest waiver green card? So the first thing is that you do need to meet the EB2 threshold requirement, and that is the minimum threshold before even going um, to the NIW uh, three-prong analysis. So how do you meet the threshold? You can meet the threshold by either of two avenues. So the first way is to show that you have an advanced degree. And an advanced degree is defined as a master's or above. So, for example, if you have a master in science or if you have a, a MBA or a JD, MD uh, or a PhD, for example, you can qualify that you have uh, an advanced degree. And if you have an advanced degree from a foreign institution, uh, you should also submit a um, uh, U.S. education equivalency report that shows that your degree in the foreign institution is equivalent to a U.S. degree at the same level. Now, there is another way you can meet the advanced degree requirement, even if you do not have a master's, and that is if you have a bachelor's degree in your field, and after you receive the bachelor's, you have five years or more of progressive work experience in your field. You can also uh, use that to qualify uh, as um, uh, a master's level degree as, a, as an equivalent. And how is what does it mean by five years of progressive work experience? It means that your duties um, and, and, and your responsibilities have changed over time progressively to more senior duties, to more senior responsibilities, um, and such that, for example, if you started off as um, a junior associate attorney, you you know you progress into a senior associate attorney, and then you progress to a partner, for example. So that is uh, um, a trajectory of a career where you are. Uh, progressively um, increasing your the seniority of your duties. So that is the kind of um, proof that the USCIS would be looking for. You would prove that through um, letters from your employers uh, to show that those duties have actually changed. Now then, what is the other way where you can meet the threshold requirement? You can meet the threshold requirement through showing that you have exceptional ability in the sciences, arts, or business. And one thing to note here for its exceptional ability that it is a very different standard from the extraordinary ability that we just spoke about in the EB1A context, and it is a lower standard. So holistically, what you want to do is provide enough evidence that shows that you have a degree of expertise in your field that is significantly above what is ordinarily encountered. 
And mind you, that is different from being one of the small percentage that have risen to the very, very top of their field. So it is a little bit of an easier standard. Now, to meet this standard, you do need to um, show that you have at least three out of the um, seven criteria that the regulations uh, mention. And this includes, uh, for example, a re relevant degree or a certificate related to your field, a license to practice in your field, uh, 10 years of a full-time experience in your field proven by letters from previous employers, um, high salary in relation to others in your field, and recognition uh, for your achievements by your peers, industry, government organizations, etc. that really... Uh, as holistically, you know, the holistic um, totality of the evidence should really show that you are operating at a level that is well beyond uh, what is ordinarily encountered. So now let's say you have met the threshold by either showing that you have an advanced degree or by showing that you have exceptional ability in the sciences, arts, or business. Now, really the core of the petition is to show that you qualify for a national interest waiver, right? And how would you prove that? So the way to prove this is to go through, um, provide evidence for each of the three prongs of the matter of Danisar uh, standard. So the first prong is that uh, your proposed endeavor in the United States should have both substantial merit and national importance. And what does this mean? So substantial merit and national importance can be shown in a wide variety of fields, including business, health, education, science, technology, and um, endeavors that further, you know, human knowledge in those key areas, such as medical advances, civil engineering, those endeavors uh, can be shown to have su substantial merit because it um, results in advancing the field in some way. Now, uh, endeavors that have a strong economic impact or that propose to have a strong economic impact is also favorable. And really what the question that you want to ask when you're preparing an NIW application is what is the future impact of your work and how is this important to the United States? How does my work advance a key priority for the U.S. government? And in this uh, in this inquiry, it is also um, recommended to search for government reports, um, executive orders, or other actions by government that really show that uh, a certain area is a priority for the U.S. government. For example, uh, if you are a researcher in environmental sustainability, you can pull government reports that confirm that environmental sustainability and research on those areas is a key priority for the U.S. government. And you would link your work to how uh, it will um, uh, uh, significantly help the U.S. governments um, to, to pursue those priorities. Now, the second prong for the matter of Danisar analysis is whether you yourself are well positioned to advance the endeavor of su substantial merit and national importance. And what does that mean? So for the second prong, the focus is on the individual. Now, you would uh, present evidence regarding your ex education, experience, and record of success in previous related projects to the project that you are proposing uh, to pursue in the United States. And really the government is looking for a track record of success in previous work, uh, previous related uh, endeavors that really show that you have the requisite skills and experience and know-how to successfully, um, successfully engage in the work that you're proposing to do. Uh, third prong is showing that on balance, it will be beneficial to the United States to waive the requirements of a labor certification. And by that, this means Usually for the EB2 category, um, the way to do it is you're, you you would have a U.S. employer and they would um, apply for a labor certification to test the U.S. labor market and show that there is no other U.S. person available to uh, take your job um, to perform in the position that they have for you. However, if you qualify for the NAW, you are exempt from having a U.S. job offer. You are exempt from having a U.S employer sponsor um, to go through that process. So a major part of the uh, NIW application is showing why you uh, you deserve that waiver, right? And you can approach this in a variety of ways. You can you know, uh, rely on prong one. Uh, you can talk about the broad systemic impacts that your work will have to the field as a whole, um, providing innovations to the field, uh, showing an original approach that has not been available that can show that can solve uh, industry-wide limitations, for example, and and 
uh, contribute to uh, U.S. Comp competitiveness in a key field, for example. You can also rely on prong too. You can talk about how you possess unique know-how and experience that other U.S. workers with minimum qualifications may not have, right? And so, and also you can also rely on special considerations regarding substantial economic benefits and job creation, right? So if you can show that your endeavor, and, and this is also a uh, uh, particularly relevant to entrepreneurs, if your project will end up generating jobs in the U.S., generating a, a high number of jobs, generating tax revenues to localities and to the state regional level, that can also be a countervailing benefit to, you know, protecting the labor market through the ordinary U.S. Um, labor certification process. So that can be another strong argument to why, on balance, it will benefit the United States to relieve you of the um, uh, onerous and time-consuming uh, processes of the labor certification requirement. All right, so let's move on to the next page. Yeah, so expert opinion letters. So I think that is um, quite an important topic to go over, how when we're approaching extraordinary ability thesis, uh, because expert opinion letters do play an important role in many of these categories. So expert letters are relevant for both O1, um, EB1, and EB2 NIW petitions. And the purpose of expert letters for those visas are a little different. So for example, if you're if you're um, preparing an EB1A or O1A petition, you would want the experts to confirm that you have extraordinary ability in your field and is well known in your field for your achievements. And you would want those letters to provide examples that show that you have su sustained national or international acclaim in your field. Now, for the NIW, right, uh, there are part, there are um, several different functions that the expert letters can play. So, for example, one type of letters can talk about the national importance of your proposed endeavor. So the letters can describe what you're trying to do, um, such as a letter from a government agency, for example, and really confirm why and how your work will uh, advance how things are done in the field as a whole or advance matters um, that are within governmental interest. And a letter from a government agency can really help with that. Um, another type of letters can focus on the second prong, well positioned to advance your endeavor. And those kinds of letters will talk about uh, the applicant's own experiences in the past um, to for the interest of showing that they are well positioned to advance the endeavor because of their education, their experiences, and record of success in their fields. So for example, this can be written by previous employers uh, confirming the applicant's leading role in a particular project that resulted in significant impact to the field, such as the development of a patented technology, for example, that was commercialized, uh, or research projects that received a lot of attention from other experts uh, through garnering a lot of citations, for example. Those are the example, the kinds of examples that we would um, ha have the experts address uh, so that uh, the USCIS examiner can really see how and why uh, this person is well positioned to advance their endeavor. Now, let's talk a little bit about who is writing the letter. So you really want to, and, and, and Kelly also mentioned this in um, one, of, one of the previous slides, but you really want to uh, speak to leading experts in the field who have uh, decades of experience. And we would typically add, um, attach the full curriculum vitae of those experts with the letters to really show that the experts are well positioned to uh, give that sort of uh, opinion, expert opinion, and that USCIS can really rely on those opinions. So you really want to um, uh, search for experts who either hold senior positions in leading leading industry institutions, for example, uh, for the O1A or EB1A, uh, you want to reach out to peer leaders in your industry. Uh, for the NAW, it is also favorable to get a letter from uh, someone who is affiliated with a governmental agency. Now, how does the individual know you? So for the O1A and... Um, ONA, EB1A, and NIW, uh, it is good to have a mix of independent experts and inner circle experts. And by inner circle experts, I mean people who have worked with you before and those people who can speak to your achievements in the past uh, because they have knowledge of those projects, because they have worked with you on those projects. 
Now, independent experts, on the other hand, are people who have not directly worked with you, but they know you through your work or through your reputation in the industry or through your extended network. And those experts can provide an objective opinion that confirm the level of your abilities and confirm that they are outstanding in your field or that your work stands to impact the field as a whole. And it is important to have these ind independent expert letters as a part of your file because USCIS uh, tends to consider them more objective. Now, what, is, what then is the content of those letters? So what should be included in the discussion in those expert letters? And here, uh, specificity is very important. And really uh, letters that are formulaic or if they simply repeat the regulatory requirements, those letters are not as effective. So for example, if a letter just states the applicant is a well-known figure, or if the, if the letter just states the applicant's project has national importance, but not give um, any uh, any further detail than that, those statements are taken as conclusory and they may not be relied on by USCIS. So specific examples of your work is important because those examples will support why you are extraordinary or why your project has national importance or why you are well positioned to uh, advance the endeavor. So for example, you would, you would include in those discussions, what exactly did you do? What problem or limitation was the industry facing? How did you solve this problem in an original way? Why was this significant? How was your work shared with other experts? How was this work received by the public, for example? So, so ask yourself those questions and really make sure to include uh, as specific details as possible in, in those letters. Okay, so we can move on to the next slide. So which category should I apply for? So the first question that is relevant in this inquiry is, do you want to stay in the United States temporarily or permanently? So uh, as Kelly mentioned before, the O1A and O1B are non-immigrant visas and really designed uh, for you to temporarily come to the U.S. and work, and after that, uh, you would return to your home country. Now, uh, for the O1A and O1B, it is also worth mentioning that uh, you can continue to renew as long as there is demand for your work in the United States. Um, and the thing about the O1A and O1B is um, compared to a green card, right? So having a green card, it gives you a permanent right to reside in the United States, but also having a green card has its responsibilities. So for example, um, if you have a green card, you cannot uh, leave the United States for extended periods of time. Um, you, you may end up losing the green card if, if you do that uh, without, um, without having um, advanced parole beforehand. Uh, but by, by contrast, if you have an ONA, OMB visa, uh, you do not have such uh, responsibilities. You can travel in and out uh, as often as, and, and as long as you want. Uh, as, however, if your intent is to permanently live in the United States, the EB1A or NIW could be a good solution because uh, they will result in a green card, which means um, you can you can work for uh, one employer. Or you can after you have the green card, you're also free to simply not work um, if you don't want to. Uh, it gives you the freedom to live and work in any uh, way you want in the United States. After, after you become a permanent resident. Now, the other question you wanna consider when you're approaching this question is, do you have a US-based employer or agent or uh, are you self-petitioning, right? So for the ONA and OMB, both categories, you do need to have a US employer, uh, a US entity, or a US person who is an agent who is filing, a pet filing the petition on your behalf. So the ONA and OMB, technically, you cannot self-petition uh, for, for yourself. However, uh, this is a question that we uh, encounter frequently is if an individual owns a company in the United States, right, can that company um, sponsor the owner um, on the O-1 visa? And the answer is that, yes, it is possible. Uh, the company is considered a separate entity. Uh, however, this can be... Uh, complicated issues so please uh, do speak to us if you uh, are um, planning to planning to uh, um, use this option 
Now, EB1A and NIW are both categories of green cards that allow the applicant to self-petition. So if you do not have either an entity or a person in the United States who can act as the petitioner, the EB1A or the NIW um, can be a great option because you don't you don't need to show such um, such a connection to the United States at the point of application. All right now, let's talk a little bit about family considerations. For the O-1 visa, uh, your spouse and children can join you um, in the United States as O-3 dependents. However, um, your spouse is not entitled to work authorization. So that is a significant um, limitation for some people. For the EB-1A and NIW, uh, this can be... Um, favorable if uh if you if you if you also want to extend green cards to your family spouse and children uh your spouse and children can apply for green cards along with you as dependents and uh, while those applications are pending uh if your spouse for example can also apply for work and travel authorization uh, and once they have those authorizations they can work for any employer in the united states All right, so let's move on to the next page. Considerations when moving from a non-immigrant visa to a green card. So one thing to really note is that although the regulatory language is similar, and, and Kelly also touched on this, um, but there is a higher standard to qualify for an EB1A green card as opposed to qualifying for an ONA or an OMB uh, visa. So, so qualifying for an ONA or an OMB does not mean you automatically qualify for an EB1A, although it is certainly possible to qualify for both uh, if you're already at the EB1A level. Now, one thing to note here is that in particular, jumping from an OMB to EB1A could be challenging, especially because the OMB standard is uh, based on distinction in the field, whereas the EB1A requires that you have sustained national or international acclaim, and you must really show that you're one of the small percentage that have reached the very top of their fields. So that is the operative language there. So jumping from an OMB to an EB1A could be uh, a little bit more challenging um, also than jumping from an ONA from an EB1A. So, so what we do uh, when, when we work with clients, really uh, some, some of the uh, evidences, uh, some of the advices that we give is you can go ahead and get the ONA or ONB, come to the United States and um, work over you know, the period of several years to continue to work on your portfolio and strengthening your profile uh, to get more evidence that can really boost you up to the level where uh, you would qualify for an EB1I in the future. Now, let's talk a little bit about timing considerations. So consider how much time is left on your current underlying visa, right? So if you need to renew your non-immigrant visa soon, let's say you are, um, you have a, a non-immigrant visa such as a TN visa, and if you need to renew your visa, it may be prudent to uh, file the renewal first uh, before pursuing, uh, before filing a, a I-140 for an an immigrant visa categorization. And the reason why is because um, for some visa categories, non-immigrant visa categories, it is very important to show non-immigrant intent. And by filing an I-140, uh, which is a petition for an immigrant visa, uh, you are in, in fact uh, showing an indication that you um, you have immigrant intent. So this could result in several difficulties uh, for, and, and this difficulty can be heightened for some categories such as the TN or the F visa, for example, uh, where, where if you're trying to renew F and, and you have already filed an I-140, you could um, face more questioning at the border or um, by USCIS. Um, dual intent visa, such as the H-1B or L-1 should not be affected by this. And it is also uh, um, something to note that O-1 visas uh, are usually considered a quasi-dual intent visa. So um, with regards to immigrant intent, there is more uh, leniency there. Now, another thing I wanted to uh, mention here is let's say your non-immigrant status is expiring soon and you're already in the United States and you're not intending to renew. Uh, does filing the immigrant petition extend your status? And this is a question that I get a lot 
Uh, and the answer is just by filing the I-140 does not give the individual um, extended status to stay in the United States, right? But once you file an I-485, which is the application to adjust status, the individual is allowed to continue staying in the United States. However, one thing to note is that the I-485, which is the actual green card application, uh, you can only file this if the priority date is current. And for EB1As, this is usually current for you know many, many countries. Uh, but right now for the EB2 NIW category, um, there is a backlog of many months. So even if you have an NIW category I-140 approved, uh, you may not be able to file the I-485 uh, as soon as you would like. So that is a consideration that, that can be uh, important regarding timing. Now let's talk a little bit about family. Um, if you have children who need to, you know, who would like to have the green card as dependents, uh, it is an important consideration to consider filing early uh, because the child may age out uh, at age 21. So that, that can also be a, a consideration that can affect when you want to file the um, I-140. All right, so the last slide here, we can discuss a little bit about um, how these extraordinary ability categories are relevant to entrepreneurs. Now, both the EB1A and NIW could be great options for entrepreneurs uh, because they both allow for self-petitions, meaning that you do not need to have a US company sponsoring you. You can apply as an individual uh, for a green card under both EB1A and EB2 NIW categories. And changes in the NIW standard under matter of Dennis R made NIW a much friendlier category for entrepreneurs. Uh, this is true. And for entrepreneurs, for example, in the third prong on balance, uh, it is beneficial to the United States to exempt the entrepreneur of a labor certification. Entrepreneurs have a, a strong leg up on meeting that uh, standard because uh, usually when you when you show that you would be opening a business, for example, and hiring U.S. workers, uh, that is in itself a um, strong countervailing consideration to um to the ordinary benefits of the US um, labor certification process, which is to save one job spot for uh, another US worker with minimum credentials. So there, there is usually a, a strong countervailing balance argument we can make in the, in the case of entrepreneurs. Now, also one, one, one other thing I wanted to mention is in 2022, uh, there has been updates announced to the policy manual uh, with respect to NIWs. So the types of evidence that entrepreneurs can use um, has, has been expanded a little bit. So for example, entrepreneurs can rely on letters from investors uh, or users talking about their particular product and its potential, for example. Uh, entrepreneurs can also rely on um, documentation of a history of hiring U.S. workers in the past, uh, past history of revenue growth and job creation through um, documents such as tax returns. Those things can support that the entrepreneur is well positioned to advance their endeavor. In the United States, um, another uh, significant change is that um, participation in incubators or accelerators and being awarded investments from venture capitals or other accredited um, institution can also support an entrepreneur's case for uh, national importance and well-positioned um, prongs. So uh, those are certain types of evidence that now the government is explicit, explicitly re uh, um, is relying on uh, to judge the merits of an NIW case in the case of entrepreneurs. So as I mentioned before uh, earlier, it is also possible to apply for an ONA as an entrepreneur. Uh, however, you do need to have a U.S. entity, a U.S. corporate entity to act as the petitioner. Uh, even if you have ownership interest in the entity, you still do need to have that U.S. entity. All right, so I believe that is all that we have. And we can turn to questions and answers. I don't believe we have any that came in. Perfect. Well, if we have no uh, no questions, um, thank you, Jay, so much for um, you know for sharing your knowledge. Um, I think it was a very interesting uh, presentation, and um, hope it was helpful for everyone who watched. Thank you. Have a thank great you. day.